time and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And I'm sure, like I was telling you before we started recording, I'm sure I'm going to botch up the name of your university, which is Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. That's right. Yes. Okay. Not too bad. Okay. Yeah. So you wrote this really cool paper on mental imagery from basic research to clinical practice for the Journal of Psychotherapy Integration. And, you know, one thing that I really want to ask you just to start off is, could you help us, you know, very quickly define what you mean by mental imagery? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, mental imagery, we define it, um, we might define it kind of formally in terms of an experience like perception in the absence of a percept. Um, but we often think of it in terms of seeing with the mind's eye or hearing with the mind's ear. So a kind of experience that's like, like a sensation, basically, a sensory experience, but in the absence of an external cause for that, um, that experience. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so if, for example, if um, I guess, yeah, if I was going to imagine, be, I could imagine being on holiday somewhere and I might have a picture in my mind's eye of the scene of like the beach or something. Um, mm -hmm. But I also might be able to hear the sounds of the waves or smell the sand or whatever it is, or feel the sand in my hands. So it can be mental imagery can be, we often think about it in terms of a visual image, but it can actually be all of your senses or any of them. Yeah. So just from the picture that you just gave, like picturing the beach or whatever, like it's something that I imagine can be very evocative, even emotionally, mental imagery can have a big impact. And in your article, actually, you review a little bit of the data of the, the research that of its impact on emotion. Would you like to like help us guide through why imagery is important or why does it matter? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's one of those things that kind of interestingly it had been, I guess, kind of assumed for a long time that mental imagery had this special relationship with emotion and you know you could you could see that people imagining things it would elicit lots of emotion but um it was i guess relatively more recently that there were um very well controlled scientific studies done to kind of test out this idea and um it seems that mental imagery or thoughts involved in mental imagery does have a very strong link with emotion so imagining if you or if you process some, some emotional information by imagery compared to just, I guess, semantically or verbally, it can generally elicit more emotion. Um, and the idea is, I mean, the thought behind it is that basically from a, um, a kind of neural perspective, imagery is processed very, very similarly to actual perception. So when you're imagining something, it's, it's as if that, um, I can't say this in a very, this will sound like a very, bad neuroscientific thing but from the from a neural perspective it's as if the it's as if the event actually is happening or it's very similar to as if the, yeah. the event actually is happening as if you're actually experiencing it when you're imagining it simply because the of the overlap between the processing of actual perception and imagined um, information right. and so when you imagine something it has this kind of direct connection to um emotional processing areas and memory as if the event actually was happening. Right. So maybe that makes a perfect link uh, to the idea of uh, linking mental imagery to psychopathology, uh, because it seems that people with in different conditions do seem to have different kind of imagery content, and there seems to be a good link. Could you just mention something about that? Yes. Yeah, so this is, um, it's kind of interesting that, and I think just about every form of psychopathology, if when people have started investigating, looking for problematic or um, manifestations of mental imagery, um, you know, people always find something there, some kind of problematic form of mental imagery. It varies from disorder to disorder. So, for example, I guess the most well-known example would be in post-traumatic stress disorder, where people might have intrusive memories of a trauma, um, which could even be like a, you know, so strong they're like a dissociative flashback. Um, in depression, people also have often experienced very intrusive, distressing memories of negative events. Mm -hmm. um, these might be, these could be traumatic, but they might also be um, experiences that come with a feeling of shame or guilt or sadness um, or I guess at the other end of the spectrum, people with bipolar disorder, when they're kind of manic or hypermanic, 
might experience very intrusive positive images of um, success experiences or kind of some yeah some kind of wonderful experience that can yeah. potentially fuel their um, manic mood and behavior. So I'm wondering, Simon, how conscious uh, are these processes in a way? Because I imagine, for example, the anxiety disorder patient that mm -hmm. if you ask them, they will tell you some, you know, threat related imagery, but maybe mm -hmm. they weren't totally aware of even having that imagery. Maybe you can say a little bit about that. Yes, no, that's a, that's a good point, because often, often the images that most of the imagery that will come into people's minds will happen spontaneously so it's not deliberate so it'll just something will just pop into someone's mind and um often it might just be a very quick flash so someone might not really be aware of having experienced an image it's they you might have to they might have to think about it to realize that that's what's just happened so right. they might have suddenly felt anxious and um i don't know decided not to either enter that room or go down that alleyway or something but um they might not have been consciously aware that they had just experienced an image showing some kind of uh, threatening event happening or some kind of danger. Right. Um, and it, I mean, it's the same in a, in, in a way, it's, just, it's similar to many other kinds of thoughts. If you're doing uh, therapy and you want to ask someone what went through your mind in that situation, right. often people do have to think about it or you, you might have to go back into the situation or replay exactly. it to try and find out the thoughts. And it's similar, you know, it's the same for imagery people might not be able to identify that it was what happened until they actually go back into that situation or reimagine yeah. it and then they can identify, yes, there was actually, I saw a scene pop into my mind of, um, I don't know, someone with health anxiety about to enter the doctor's appointment might have a scene of the, the doctor telling them the bad news about their, you know, you've got this awful illness. But until they've introspected about that, they might have just been, aware that suddenly they felt really anxious about walking into the doctor's appointment. So you're just making now the bridge to clinical practice. It's funny, as I was reading the paper, one of the things that popped up to me was exactly like, for example, in the CBT literature, it's we, we read so much about automatic thoughts, mm. but not so much about automatic uh, imagery, imagery, right? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, we talk about thoughts and I guess, I mean, there's no, there isn't a kind of dichotomy between, you know, images and other kind of, you know, many thoughts will come with some aspect of imagery and right. um, I don't, there isn't, there is, there isn't kind of pure, generally I think there's probably not pure <laughs> imagery or non-imagery thoughts, but often when we talk about thoughts, um, we think about, we might think about them in terms of, um, I don't know, a negative automatic thought like, like I'm a bad person or, um, they don't like me or something. Whereas, yeah, they might be an image of a memory of you that encapsulates that meaning of being a failure yeah. right. or something like that. Right. So how did you get into this, by the way? What drew your interest into this topic of mental imagery? Yeah, so um, I guess I was doing my clinical psychology training in Oxford and I saw Emily Holmes give a talk about some of her research on mental imagery. And it felt, um, it felt like it intuitively made sense. And it was very interesting because it, it, it made a lot of sense. But also I could tell that it was something that was, you know, under the search, there was so much we you know, didn't know. Right. Um, and so I approached her about doing uh, my doctoral thesis with her and ended up working with her on um, looking at um, training positive imagery in the context of Fashion. and mm. yeah it kind of went from there mm. really um, and I guess when I was um, after I first did my training I was working full-time in clinical practice before I went into research and um, if you're thinking about imagery and you find it interesting then you ask, start asking people about imagery in clinical practice you basically find it everywhere um, it's probably the same for you know other things if you're interested sure. in imagery, when you ask about it you'll find it everywhere but um, once you start asking about it and seeing it everywhere, it becomes very difficult to ignore and it's very compelling that there's something that's something important here. And, you know, and there's very, um, sometimes very powerful 
things you can do with the imagery. And so once you start working with it, then it's, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to not, to not work with it. <laughs> so you mentioned that imagery in a way can be connected with memory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but also it can be just uh, something that a person construes uh, in the reality that they are in. One interesting thing, be it memory or be it construed, is that now we have a lot of imagery-based techniques in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of, like, historically, what were maybe some of the landmarks for this? Because personally, I know that maybe in psychodrama or gestalt, they did use some imagery-type work. But I'm wondering, from your perspective and your readings, where do you think this traces back to? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I don't have a full overview of the, of the history. There's a really nice overview in the, um, the book by Anne Hackman, Emily yeah. Holmes, and James Bennett Levy. The first chapter has this very nice, um, yeah. by Edwards, has this very nice historical overview. Um, but there's, I think it's one of those things that has traces all over the place, really, like the Gestalt therapy, like you mentioned, um, and also, I guess, you know, hypnosis-based techniques. Right, um, all right, right. All those kinds of things as well and also um, I guess and then within cognitive therapy as well um, you know Beck writes a lot about imagery it's, it's there in a lot of that writing um, and and behavior therapy as well with imaginal exposure and so on so I think it's one of these things that's been that's been used everywhere to some extent in different ways and then has kind of yeah has percolated Mm -hmm. through the, the different techniques and schools of therapy in yeah, different forms, I guess. What's your sense of the research focused on this kind of interventions, on imagery-based interventions? Do we have a lot of research on this? Um, I think it's an area that's really grown in the past um, 20, 15, 20 years or so. I mean, there's, I mean, there's always been bits of research, research on it and as I said, in the um, you know behavior, behavior therapy, you can see things like Volpe or Isaac Marx and people that's lots of imagery um, used there. But um, yeah, I guess in the past 20, 15, 20 years, kind of in hand with some of the more recent um, scientific research into mental imagery, that I guess neuroimaging imaging really helps kind of re-kickstart that as well. Right. Um, so. You know, there's people looking a lot of detail at things like imagery scripting, for example, in the mm -hmm. Netherlands, when I danced and right. people, or um, I guess, yeah, and other, other kinds of imagery techniques. Um, I guess, in, you know, people in Australia, David Kavanagh, looking at motivational imagery and so on. There's, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of different things kind of that have, I guess in the past 15, 20 years or so, I think there's been this kind of explosion really or acceleration of, of imagery and interest in um, really studying these techniques and the kind of broader therapies that encompass them in, in a lot more detail. Yeah. Have you found anything of particular interest to you in terms of imagery-based techniques or interventions that you particularly enjoy reading or uh, trying out? Um, well, I guess... I find, I mean, I've always found the, the idea of the imagery scripting very compelling because mm -hmm. I think it's one of these things that um, when you try to explain it to someone in terms of, you know, having a, a different ending to this traumatic memory or something, it sometimes sounds quite crazy in a way or weird. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it seems just incredibly effective. Um, right. This is and, the, more the schema therapy tradition, correct? Yes, I guess it's come, it's come out of the kind of schema therapy tradition. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, it's one of these things that, you know, now, um, yeah, particularly, say, Arnold Dance is do, has been doing a lot of research, really trying to understand what's going, what's going on right. here, what are the mechanisms here. Right. And it's one of these, yeah, it's one of these techniques that, on a superficial level, when you describe it, sounds yeah, just. <laughs> <laughs> but it's clinically, it seems very effective, and you know, sometimes very rapidly effective in terms of um, reducing the distress from uh, distressing memory, um, and 
I think we we probably still don't have a very you know a very, we still have, we still can't be very confident or secure in terms of our understanding of how exactly it works. But I think it's one of these areas where um, yeah, it's just it's just really fascinating in terms of trying to understand how can we understand how how doing this makes changes in terms of how this I don't know how the memory is stored or retrieved that actually has such a massive massive right. impact. Right, so you're talking now about the mechanism part, right? Mm -hmm. like, is there a memory consolidation piece here or what's underlying these kind of interventions? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't have a good answer to that at the moment. <laughs> That's probably the, the correct answer for what we know by now, right? That we really don't know. I guess so, yes. <laughs> okay, so Simon, this is a really cool, interesting topic with a lot of clinical, um, I think, uh, Applicability. So I want to thank you for, first of all, writing such a cool article, reviewing that data. And I hope people not just read it, but start seeing how they can apply it in clinical practice. Mm. I hope so too. And I hope it really, um, I guess my hope is it makes people think about imagery who, you know, they might not have done it, might not have thought about it otherwise. Because I think that's one of the main things is that if you don't, if you're not thinking about it, you won't ask about it and you won't find it um, places. And um, but if you know it's there and something to be asked about or something you can do something with, then you can start, yeah, start trying to use it or think about ways in which you can, you can assess it, in, you know, incorporate it into formulations and use it in, in therapy as well. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for talking to me.